Hey guys, before we get started, I wanted to tell you about a free resource on the Scrivener Solutions website. We all know that consistency builds trust, but somehow getting on that consistency train can be hard. Finding the time, thinking of what to say. Oh my goodness, believe me, I feel your pain. I get it. I know all too well the struggle. Sometimes we make things way too complicated for ourselves. You don't need a complicated plan to become consistent with your content marketing. Working that consistency muscle by using a super simple content plan will give you a big win and you can build upon that. We have a free resource to help you. Go over to scrivenersolutions.com forward slash checklist and download the super simple strategy to jumpstart consistent content creation checklist. Yes, it's a long name, but all you have to remember is scrivenersolutions.com forward slash checklist and you can get that instant download. Get started on the right foot and make the commitment to consistency. Other things will follow, but consistency really does matter. Start super simple and download the checklist at scrivenersolutions.com forward slash checklist. All right, now on to the show. Hi, I'm Gayla Scrivener, ex corporate girl and now work from anywhere adventure seeker. Creating a work from anywhere lifestyle isn't without its challenges, but those challenges certainly don't overshadow all the many benefits. What breaks my heart is seeing folks stuck and unhappy in a career and lifestyle when they want more out of life. I believe that we all have the opportunity to create the life of our dreams and earn a living in fun and creative ways to make our dream lifestyle a reality. You too can experience wonderful adventure and freedom as you live life on your own terms. In this weekly podcast, I share experiences when it comes to growing a lifestyle business through guest interviews, content marketing experience and perspectives, virtual leadership lessons, and I'll even throw in some travel adventures. My hope is through all the interviews, the tips, advice, and personal experience, you'll be inspired and motivated to keep going and creating your dream lifestyle. Life's an adventure. There's no time but the present to live life to the fullest. Hi there, and welcome to today's show. I am excited for you to meet my guest, Frank Spivak. I met Frank a few months ago, and I have really learned a lot from him, and I wanted you to meet him. Frank is a speaker, online educator, author, and business coach. He trains business owners how to quickly develop marketing skills and business strategies necessary to future-proof their business for sustainable success. Before running his own business, Frank worked as chief marketing and sales officer for a successful multi-million dollar technology company in Minnesota. He left his corporate job at the end of 2019 and started his new business just as the pandemic was about to start. Now in hindsight, maybe it wasn't the best time to start something new, but really, who knew that was going to happen? And when you start something new, how do you know what the future is going to hold? You don't, right? Is there a best time to start something new? Well, I love Frank's story and hearing how he used his principles for long-term and sustainable success for launching his business during a time when many thought was not the most favorable timing. Well, let's go ahead and hop over to the interview, shall we? Hey, Frank, so glad that you're here with me today. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Gayla. Thanks for having me. Well, before we get started in the interview, I would love for you to tell my listeners a little bit about yourself. I have been in the corporate world for almost all of my life and been with a variety of companies and lots of different careers. I was a headhunter. I worked for a, a marketing agency. I worked for manufacturers. I make, worked for uh, distributors. But for the last 20 years of my corporate life, I was the chief marketing officer for a small business here in uh, 
Minneapolis, Minnesota, and a member of the management team, basically uh, uh, myself, the owner and the general manager, uh, ran the company, uh, setting direction and developing strategies and, and product development and things like that. So over the years, I've been with good companies. I've been with so-so companies and bad companies. I've just taken in all of that information to kind of create my own ideas of what a good leader is, a good manager, and ways to future-proof a business so that it's successful year after year after year. So you left your corporate life to start your own thing? Yes, I did. And, uh, and, and part of it was because of the frustration that I experienced while I was there. And I, I probably should have done it years before. The allure of being in a corporate environment and being able to set some direction allows you the... Uh, uh, the comfort of a regular paycheck, certainly, but at the same time, the frustration keeps building in an environment where you know it could be better and you provide the advice to help things get better. And yet the company still does the same things over and over again to not be better. And so I finally said, that's it. I'm out of here. And certainly my wife was happy because uh, coming home at the end of the day after a very frustrating time in a management meeting that may last four hours, we get rather frustrated. And and certainly the commute home helped to mitigate some of that. But my wife did... Uh, did become the brunt of, of a lot of that frustration. And, and so when it, uh, I finally called it quits, she was pretty happy as well as myself for my own mental well wellbeing. Uh, it was a, it was a, a great transition. The sad part of it is that I started this company just as the pandemic hit. So it's been, it's been an unusual uh, 18 months. Well, I bet so. You know, through the pandemic, everybody's lives were turned upside down. They might have not had that choice or that decision. They may not have been in that mental space of, I've had it and I'm going to start something new. And you're already in that mental space to make a go of it. Yeah, I had that luxury because I had already, I had made that decision and well, set, set all of the the different things in place that were needed, you know, the financial support that's there, trying to collect things from my office, and certainly, you know, time to create all of the necessary uh, legal and tax documents. So I had that opportunity uh, before leaving to to get that in place. And uh, and you're right, other people were forced into that without necessarily having the ability to think about it. What kind of business have you developed? You left your corporate world and developing a consulting business? Yeah, so it's a a business and marketing, consulting uh, strategy business. The idea of helping small businesses, especially the trades contractors, HVAC uh, contractors in particular, to develop the skills and strategies to, to really take their business to the next level. And so over this last 18 months, I've interviewed a lot of individuals, a lot of, lot of uh, companies and executives finding out what's, well, basically what kinds of things uh, they experienced during the pandemic. And so I've been doing a lot of writing and doing webinars on leadership and management and, and, uh, and things like that to just try and get the message across that, yeah, things are bad, but, you know, it's, things have been bad, you know, intermittently for, for decades. I've lived through, you know, given my age, I've lived through a number of different crises, you know, going back into high school days, the oil embargo. So there's been a crisis, I've been a, a, certainly a minor crisis every two to four years, but there's been a major crisis every, every decade. And there are companies that survive and those companies are the ones that uh, resilient is a word that gets uh, tossed around, but it's uh, learning organizations. If they have that idea of continuous learning, they will figure out a way to make it happen. You serve trades industries. You said HVAC, maybe contractors, different things like that. Do they have different struggles than other businesses? I mean, what kind of struggles do they have in growing their business? Well, I think the, the, the struggles are the same 
It's just that there are lots of small companies. It's the owner worker uh, mentality or thinking that takes place as opposed to being a, a leader owner. You know, the owner worker mentality is that they are in the business. They are constantly uh, battling to do the, the right thing. They're trying to help customers. They're still trying to manage the office. They're trying to manage crews. And they, they struggle when they start getting more and more people as their business does get successful. And so the idea is trying to transition them away from uh, the fact that they have to go out on, on different jobs. Something that's been a perpetual pain for, um, for the contractors is callbacks. Callbacks, meaning that the job is completed, but something still isn't right. So somebody has to go back out and fix it. And as soon as you do that, you start whittling away at whatever profit you made. And so I see that as uh, something that they still struggle with. And it's, it's an easy fix, but they, they struggle with that uh, over and over again. And it's, I think, because they're, they're, they're in the business rather than thinking about the business or being above the business and thinking about the activities that could be done to uh, avoid all those callbacks. So do you find that in this, in the trade industries that the entrepreneur, the business owner, they were a fantastic employee somewhere else. And then they started on their own. They have to think differently. And as they grow and get more clients, then their leadership training needs to be honed in, not necessarily the skills on what they do in the trade, but it's the leadership, the is that the soft skills, I guess you can say? Yeah, they, that's exactly it. They've gone to trade school and had years on the job. And they start off by saying, well, I can do a better job than my boss, my, my owner can do. And they go off on their own and they're able to get a few jobs and make things happen, and which, is, which is great. Uh, but then they start getting more and more advanced. And now the manage, the management and leadership skills need to kick in and they're never taught at the trade school level. So they, they need to figure out a way to still make money, make a profit, still keep on selling. But at the same time, they need to figure out how to lead. Essentially, they, they need an MBA in about 30 minutes. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and they, they don't have that opportunity to do it, especially uh, for HAC contractors in the summer. And this summer has been, a, I would imagine, a really tough one because they are, they're short of employees. Uh, so the owner's out there probably. Uh, the owner's certainly taking care of the callbacks. Uh, so the owner doesn't necessarily have time to think about you know, the quarterly profits because they're worried about making sure that uh, Mr. Jones and Mrs. Smith's house are getting taken care of. That's an interesting point. I think that everywhere I see that there's help wanted signs. It seems like every business is needing help and there is not enough applicants or help to be out there. So I can imagine that as a, as a business owner, you, you might need some help uh, outside, help to, to think differently, to strategize, how do I work more efficiently because I'm not getting more applicants? Do I need to change my strategy a little bit? Do I take all jobs or do I niche down even further? You know, there's so many possibilities that if you're working in your business, you can't really see or identify where the opportunities are. Yeah. And in the HAC industry in particular, the, well, I shouldn't say in particular because we're, see, you're, we're seeing it everywhere, but they need a qualified person to do a job. And the jobs are actually very well paid. It's, it's not uncommon for a technician to, to make $100,000, $120,000 a year, especially in a season like, like we're, we're experiencing right now. But they have a hard time actually getting people to go there. And they're also subject to employee theft in the sense that there's so few technicians that other companies are stealing their employees. Oh, um, to go to work somewhere else. So when that happens, the company where the te technician left, they're stuck. Do they try and steal someone from somebody else uh, or do they have to do the work themselves? And a lot of times they wind up doing the work themselves. Yeah. Which yeah. digs them a deeper hole than, than they had to begin with. I know that on your website, you feature your book, 
uh, principles for sustainable success. So what is the measure of success? What's the ruler? And maybe what is sustainable success? Sustainable success is the is the ability to continually grow year after year, essentially to be on autopilot. That, that's the way I view sustainable success, that you're able to continue to do the work of improving yourself and your business so that it winds up being a money-making machine. Instead of being focused on monthly and quarterly goals and trying to hit targets and things like that, when you have a longer-based approach When you think about uh, how do I need to develop as an owner, what skills do I need to get myself to be better as a leader and manager of this company? And then what skills and abilities do my employees need and address those and work with those? And essentially what I believe is the continuous learner mentality. When you have that continuous learner mentality, you, uh, you can't, you aren't stuck you will always have the ability to adapt to things that happen in the future. So that sustainable success comes from the time that you devote to developing yourself and developing your employees. And you need to develop your employees because if you don't have your employees, you really don't have a company. Absolutely. So I know that one of your eight principles is continued education, long-term continuing education, not necessarily you're not going back to college. What kind of education is out there that any business owner can can have? How can we get education continually? So continuous education comes from a lot of different things. And especially in the trades contracting area, there's lots of conferences, lots of places to actually interact with other people to get a better insight about how to run their business more effectively. Uh, certainly hiring a coach, hiring a mentor, having an accountability partner to help that owner improve themselves, keep the business on track are are important. But even spending an hour, 10, 15 minutes even, listening to a master class on something that you don't know right now. When you're concentrating in the business and you're, you know, for an, for a technician, you know, trying to figure out how to do the uh, temperature corrections and fix the electronics board in, a, in an air conditioner. That's, you know, you've gone to school for that and yeah, they've made advances, but you need to think about some of the other stuff. How do I look at my numbers? Uh, you've had Jim Adams as a, as a guest and, you know, knowing your numbers um, is vital. And a lot of them still don't know how to calculate that uh, properly for themselves. Spending some time on a master class, joining a, uh, a mastermind or a thinking partner group is also worthwhile because then you get other ideas from other successful people. And when you get those, then that becomes um, a motivation for yourself to do better. So lots of different ways of continuous learning, even just read a book, you know, David Epstein's book on range is, has been a, a very, very interesting book on the idea that if you continue to learn, you have a better chance of solving problems. It's a, it's a terrific book. If if you or your guests haven't read Range by David Epstein, I would highly encourage that. I'll uh, look up a link and have that in the uh, in the show notes. Thanks for the recommendation. This year, I have made it more intentional to have so many books read by the end of the year, and I found myself that I've surpassed that already because I've just like. Oh, I'm like actually counting. Have you ever encountered folks to say, I just don't have time? Oh, if- absolutely. Absolutely. I, 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 part of my, you know, my career was kind of like that. Uh, that's how I got this philosophy of continuous learning. Everything was going along. Why do I need to do anything else? I'm busy enough. I don't have time for it. But at the same time, it's the ability to recognize I'm missing something. And that's what happened throughout my career. When I was just a, a customer service agent at one company, I realized that I knew quite a lot, but I needed the degree to get into the quote unquote club of management. So at the age of 28, I went back to college, spent eight years at night school to get my bachelor's degree. Then after that, spent a couple more years to get my my MBA. But every time I've my career has stalled. It's because I've felt I've I've had I've done enough, which you can never 
do enough, I guess would be the way to say that, I, that I've done enough uh, and that I know that I know enough. And that's never the case. And so going, even going back to college, I had to repeat high school algebra in order to get oh. into college. <laughs> it was tough. Oh, that had to been painful. <laughs> that was tough. Uh, and, you know, I, and I, I credit some really great instructors. I, I had a, a business calculus course and, and I understand st- statistics. I just can't calculate them. Uh, and I, I tell you, I was, I was traveling internationally carrying around, this goes back. I was carrying around my textbooks on my business trips to Europe, studying on the airplane. And then when I got back, I would meet with my instructor an hour before class and say, I still don't get it. But other than that, it's the avenues that get opened up, uh, the books that are, that are introduced in a lot of the different courses. My MBA course had, had a lot of uh, individual books that were terrific to expand the mind. We even actually had a couple of the authors as instructors at the University of St. Thomas for my MBA program. So it was really a, a terrific um, uh, atmosphere. But it's always, uh, it, it's that kind of uh, thing where if you've settled, if you're stuck, time to go back and, and learn something. I think it's interesting. I, I too went back to school later. I was in my late 20s, maybe early 30s, can't remember. And I was busier then than I was when I was younger, but I paused to start my family. I didn't feel like I could go back until uh, my daughter was a certain age, but I was busier then with a full-time job and uh, raising a child, going back on top of that. And so I think that we should be most receptive about learning in the busiest time of our life, because then we can get over a hump that we're trying to get over makes yeah. us think differently. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, there's one, uh, one story that I'm, I'm writing an article about one company that I was with during the uh, 2008, nine, 10 uh, housing crash the, the, our company benefited from the uh, American recovery and reinvestment act to the, to an amount of essentially tripling our business Wow. In 24 hours or 24, 20, not 24 hours, 24 months. We 24 tripled months, our business uh-huh. in 24 months. Profits quadrupled in that time frame. We were so busy taking orders and fulfilling orders that we didn't have time to plan. And in the back of my mind, and I, I kept telling people, you know, this is going to end. <laughs> Someday, somehow, this is going to end, and we need to start figuring out what's next. I couldn't get the owner past that that mentality, and uh, so when it hit, it was devastating because we wound up just burning through cash. Uh, all that money we stockpiled, you know, everybody made uh, huge bonuses, and we still stockpiled tons of cash for the business, but we squandered that time. And I think that's a, that's a big part of it. We squandered the time. And so for probably two to three years afterwards, we struggled with trying to figure out who we were and what we were going to do and what's the next product and, and things like that. And in the process, we, we basically wiped out all the money that we had, uh, we had saved. So riding the wave of, of prosperity is one thing, but during that time, I, I hear you that a lot of people, I mean, it's tendency. It's like, hey, just wait, ride that wave and we get lazy. <laughs> I mean, lazy in the planning. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's not until, holy crap, something's happened. We better plan. In reading your book that anybody can download, and I'll have the, the link uh, in the show notes, but the principle for sustainable success, you list the eight principles to continually do for getting through the good times and the bad times, because fast growth is maybe a good problem to have, but if you don't do it properly, it's not sustainable. Exactly. Yes. And you could crash and, I, and burn seen, fast. <laughs> yeah. And I've seen that. And we, we, we had an opportunity that we, we lost because we were, um, you know, top of the game. Uh, we were the industry leader. We eventually lost that leadership status. Uh, we fell years behind on product development, as well as losing all that money that could have been 
uh, reinvested in a, in a better way rather than just trying to keep ourselves afloat and, and make that happen. But it's, and it, it can be a hard reality. I understand that. I, I truly do that. These are hard realities that owners of any business, you know, small, medium, large contractors, they'll have that reality hit them in the face uh, like a two by four uh, when they least expect it. And I feel for them. And the way around that is, is, uh, is planning. And I, I, I always love the, the quote from um, uh, Dwight Eisenhower when he was general, Supreme Allied Commander, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable because uh, every military person knows that as soon as the, the battle starts, whatever you plan goes out the window, <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> but if yeah. you plan it, if you can come up with all those contingency plans to figure out what to do. And yeah. so, so I try to put some of that in the book. That is so true. In your book, you do list eight principles and you shared one, which is continually learning, having that that mindset of continuing learning. Would you care to share another principle and how we can apply it? The very next one is uh, learn to unlearn. So we've got the first part is continuous learning. Okay. Where you are trying to accumulate knowledge and experience and, and trying to gain uh, wisdom in, in your business and your activity. But the, the second part of that is to learn to unlearn, meaning that when you go out and you try something and it doesn't work, try to figure out why that happened. Throughout my career, I've been surrounded by some people that were, um, when something went wrong, the first reaction was, who can we blame? Oh, I've okay. been with that's, that's not a healthy environment. You know, so you've lost. What is it that went wrong? Try to analyze that. Uh, because then when you can figure that out, you have an opportunity to make the next go at it more successful. Uh, and there is a, the, the adage that uh, you don't really learn from success, you learn from failure. If you organize, if you create a structure to take that failure and analyze it, take out the things that may have not have worked and replace those with things that could work and you try again, you're going to be in a much, a much better place to see how things grow. You said a lot of people try to do the, the blame game and it's the who, who can I blame? But do you find it's more so not on a who, but on what in the system is not working? That's what it should be. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what that truly is what it should be. But I, I still see things like if a company has sales that are down, the first thing to do is blame the salesman. Well, you're not doing your job when it could entirely be uh, market conditions as well as the company conditions that uh, cause the salesman not to make those sales. So if you've lost your leadership position, if your product is inferior to, to what's out there, maybe there's a new competitor that, that you hadn't counted on before. There are a lot of other dynamics that could be taking place. And yet the salesperson gets blamed for not making quota. And that's a fairly common instance. And yes, there are salespeople that may not be doing their job, but if we stop for a second and try and analyze what's going on, you might find that there's uh, systemic issues that you know, no matter what, that salesperson is not going to meet their quota. When you help the trades industries, and that's who you primarily focus on, as well as some, some other service-based businesses, but... Do you consult in overall planning, overall processes, operations, or is it specific to marketing or sales, or is it an overall type of business consulting? Well, I try and concentrate on two parts. One is the, uh, the business owner and the business processes making sure that you are in charge of, and you understand the operations, the operation side of the business. Uh, the sales and marketing side of the business, and the legal and finance part of the business, making sure that all those processes are in place, you have the right people in place, things like that. But also, you know, my background has always been in marketing and branding. So I try to concentrate on that as well. Are you actually saying what you need to say to, to make yourself more appealing to the customers, to reach your market the way that you want to do that? and to build your company's reputation. One of the reasons for, for building the company reputation could actually help in retaining and hiring employees. 
you have a good reputation, people will stick around. People will want to work for you and you won't have right. as and much turnover. Yeah. Yes. And people, you know, it's a, it's a, another kind of business adage that people join causes rather than people. And so if your company has a, a great vision, a great direction, and you're able to let the employees be part of that and support it and, and really be involved in that vision, then uh, they'll, they'll stick around. But if you micromanage and you browbeat and, and you go after individuals, they're not going to stick around. No, but I like that, that you can bring it all together to teach or consult in all the, the areas so that you can create the right team and lead the right team. Yeah. And it's, and it's also the case where, you know, just because you're the owner doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be the CEO. You can have, you can hire a CEO. And if you still want to be the technician, be the technician or the crew chief, you're still the owner. You just hire the CEO to manage the business uh, or the general manager or whoever you need. So it's, it's a process of, you know, understanding what is it that you want and understanding your limitations. And, and maybe you go to that point where you're learning and you're learning and you're saying, you know, I've learned that this is not my strong suit. Then find the people to, to fill that. Excellent. Since you've made the leap, what has been your biggest reward? One of my biggest rewards was I took some time not doing sales pitch, but just asking people, look, share your stories with me. Let me hear what you've experienced during 2020. There's a lot of really great lessons. And actually, I, I scheduled a, a time to talk to a business owner that I've known for 30 years. We spent time talking about his business during 2020, how in March of 2020, the business kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller to the point of him worrying about, okay, when do I even shut the doors? Not just laying off people. When do I shut the doors? Actually going into a bit of a, a personal depression. But then his business, because of the way it was uh, positioned, business started to grow at the end of April and the beginning of May. And he basically uh, doubled his business in 2020 versus 2019. And it was, yes, he was in the right place at the right time uh, with the right business model. But he'd spent the 10 years prior to that getting himself in position. And so during the during 2020, when I started talking to people and just said, give me your stories, that seemed to be the one thing that was common with everybody is that they had already been doing some planning and not major complete overhauls, minor things, just continuously improving themselves and their, their business and their employees. And those are the guys and women that really prospered. And when the pandemic hit their business, they were ready. So if they did take a hit, one trainer I know, instead of being able to go out and train, they spent the time rewriting all their training materials so that when they could get back in-person training, they had a phenomenal amount of new training material that was really spot on. When you, when you take that time, keep thinking about the business and on the business, it's, it's served all of those owners immeasurably. That's a great lesson. When there is a pause, you can still be productive. Yes, absolutely. And think of the long game, not the short discomfort, I guess. Plan in good times and bad times. Yeah. And I, I had another guy that I've known for, for years with his business. He had hired a, a business coach probably eight, nine years before the pandemic hit. And that business coach was able to help him do minor things each year to make improvements so that at some point he could leave the business. He he knew, I, I mean, we, we all have a finite time here on earth. So he knew that he wanted to turn the business over to the employees at some point. And so he actually spent the time over eight years to get that in line. And so when the pandemic hit, he had already put all those things in place. He stayed in the business, certainly to make sure things uh, were working, but he also knew he had, he had confidence that it was a sustainable business. It had sustainable success. Nice. I just love what you do, Frank. Thanks for joining me today. Besides the book that you had mentioned, uh, Range, do you have a, another favorite resource or book that has really made a difference for you professionally? 
certainly all the Ma all the books by John C. Maxwell have been immeasurable. But uh, I also go back to a time frame when uh, Peter Drucker was uh, was the guru. And so my first leadership book was The Effective Executive uh, by Peter Drucker. Absolutely the touchstone of understanding the difference between being a manager and being a leader, and then how to be an effective leader, an effective executive, and understanding that time is a valuable commodity that you need to guard uh, preciously. So I do lean on, on Peter Drucker for quite a few things. Very good. Very good. Well, how do people connect with you, Frank? Certainly the best way is through my website. And it's pretty simple, frankspivak.com. There's resources there. Uh, you can download a copy of my, my book. And if you want to connect, if you want to uh, just have a conversation, I'd be more than happy to spend some time and, and hear, what you, hear what you need. Oh, thanks for joining. I'll have all the links in the show notes. Thanks again, Frank. Sure. Thank you, Gail. Thanks for listening. What was your biggest takeaway from Frank's story? Mine was that you should never, ever be too busy for learning and definitely never too busy for planning. Now be sure to download his book, Principles for Sustainable Success. Those eight strategies any business owner can use to make their company a success year after year. Just go to Frank spivak.com forward slash PSS. It's pretty simple. F-R-A-N-K-S-P-E-V-A-K.com forward slash PSS. Now, I have all the links in the show notes, so don't worry if you didn't catch the spelling of everything. So hop down into the show notes and get the, the direct link. Now, next week, be sure to join me as I interview Diane Wolf. I reconnected with Diane after losing touch with her for about, goodness, I think it was about two years. And she had made some major transitions during that time. And I am in awe. I know that you'll love meeting her. Now, remember, over there at Scrivener Solutions, my team can help you implement your content marketing plan. If you think that hiring an agency is too big business for you, well, think again. Our business model best fits with the solopreneur, the coaches, the consultants, the speakers out there who have grown their businesses to six figures and really need to scale beyond that while not necessarily wanting to manage an entire marketing team. My team takes care of the tedious details with content publishing and production. You focus on your message and take care of your clients. Let's talk more. Go ahead and go over and schedule a call by going to ScrivenerSolutions.com. Let's see if our content plan implementation services are the right fit for you. Well, thanks again. Glad you are here with me today. And until next time. Have a fantastic week.